affected by this <coughs> problem. So, um, so we're basically going to look at a drop bouncing on a soap film. Okay. Uh, and so we saw <laughs> the talk you saw motivated this. So you have these drops bouncing on a fluid bath, on a vibrating fluid bath. And they exhibit all sorts of uh, features of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and so now we actually have a, a model for their dynamics. But this is the first step in that direction. So the difficulty in the model is you have to, the inertia of the fluid is actually important. Uh, so things get rather complicated. But to leading order, we'll see that you can, behave, you can think of a drop hitting a free surface like a linear spring. Okay, so I'll convince you, I hope to convince you of that today. And so, <clears throat> so the, uh, we'll see this through looking at um, a drop bouncing on a soap film. So actually, in the, so first we look at a drop hitting a stationary film and get criterion for breakthrough. And then we look at a drop bouncing on a vibrating film. And on the vibrating film, we'll see that you can get steady bouncing states and then they go, you get period doubling transitions and the onset of chaos in the bouncing. And so this is a really a, uh, a classic chaotic oscillator and so all of the sort of mathematics one uses for uh, develops in dynamical systems uh, can be applied to this system. And it's, it, I think it's one of the simplest fluid mechanical uh, chaotic oscillators uh, looked at and, and so <coughs> uh, so right so we so the two problems the first is what's the criterion for breakthrough if we have a drop hitting a soap film uh, so it's the same fluid in the drop and in the film. Um, and we expect the key parameter here. We don't expect viscosity to be dominant. We expect the, the Weber number, which is uh, basically the kinetic energy of the drop to the surface energy. Okay. Um, and then in the second, in the second uh, <coughs> experiment, we look at a drop bouncing on a film. We, uh, we do a little trick to, to stabilize the, dropping, uh, the drop on axis because uh, soap films don't care about gravity because they're too light. So they're basically going to be flat no matter what. And so unless your system is perfectly level, the thing, you'll get a film like this and the drop will just uh, bounce off. So the way you get around this is we apply a little bit of suction here. So by applying suction, we make this slightly uh, concave and so the thing bounces on axis. So we're, we're just interested in stationary bouncing. Okay. And so here we drive. So we drive the system now with a uh, <coughs> loudspeaker, and so that it has this characteristic acceleration. So that's the frequency and that's the amplitude of the driving. Okay, and so the fluid we use is gliss so glycerin water. Uh, so it's twice as viscous as water. Surface tension around 22 times per centimeter. Um, drop radius uh, around a millimeter and the frame radius around 8. So we use different frame sizes for these two experiments. But in any case. Are you saying water dove? A, a dove. Dove is a soap. Right. Yeah. 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 So uh, it's just a commercial soap. Yeah. OK. So um, <clears throat> right. So what can, uh, what can happen? So we see the thing impacting. On the left, it bounces. On the right, it goes through. Right? And so all there had been. Before this was some scaling arguments, which uh, my old supervisor done, Howard Stone. But we, I think, so solved this um, pretty convincingly. And so, so in addition to, so basically, when the thing goes slowly, it will bounce. If it goes quickly, it will break through, right? And there's actually a whole family of possibilities. So the uh, thing to note is that uh, when it passes through, it actually doesn't break the film, right? Which is interesting kind of thing, oh, it's going to break when it breaks through. But actually what happens is it goes into the film, gets, so it hits, then the air layer between the drop and the bath gets sufficiently thin that it merges. So then the drop is inside the film, and then it falls out of the bottom, right? But it doesn't break the film. Because again, the film has, it's a soap film, so it doesn't want to break. Right? It has, uh, it's basically elastic by virtue of the surfactants. And so here, as it, so it enters the film, and parts of it can <coughs> be thrown up, up or down. So uh, when it, it can be ejected up or down. I think the one at the bottom, things are ejected both up and down. Is that right? There's one of them. 
I can't remember which one. But yeah, sometimes you'll get things going both up and down. Wait. This one. This one. You see that? So you see a, you can see a small drop being uh, shot up. So it, most of it goes down, but part of it goes up, right? So you can, yeah. Okay. And so, so if we look at the probability of passing, <coughs> its dependence on the Weber number. There's basically a critical Weber number around, say, 15, uh, beyond which the thing will pass through. So if you hit a Weber number less than 15, the thing will not merge and it will simply bounce. Okay. And so this is one simple question we'd like to be able to uh, rationalize. Why 15? Okay, and so the model is quite simple. Uh, so, <coughs> and you guys are all uh, capable of doing this. We say basically, so in the impact, we have this air layer between the drop and the film, and this communicates stress between the two, right? So it's, it's a lubrication layer. Uh, so there, because it's so thin, there can be no gradients in pressure across the thin layer. So basically, its role is simply to communicate stresses from here to here, from here to here, right? So we know that the force acting on the film is equal and opposite to the force acting on the drop, okay? So what you do is, you know, hydrodynamically, you solve for the pressure uh, within the film, and that's uh, a normal stress acting here and here. So uh, what's that saying is that if we, by uh, tracking the shape of the film, we're also getting the force here on the drop, okay? And so if we assume that the drop doesn't change much in, uh, in its shape, which it doesn't, at low, certainly at lower speed impacts, then the only surface energy that's changing is out of the film, okay? And so <coughs> we can... Uh, and so if we know the shape of the film as a function of position, then we know the energetic cost to its moving a certain amount, a distance dx downwards, and that gives us the force. So the gradient of the surface energy with respect to x is the force acting on the drop, right? And so <coughs> the approximation <coughs> is that this thing is quasi-static. That is to say, the shape of the film at any given instant only depends on the uh, current position of the drop, okay? And so that turns out to be true, and it's true because uh, basically the wave speed on soap films is very high. It's about three meters per second, and so if our uh, uh, motion is much smaller than that, these waves basically go off uh, immediately and uh, communicate information to the walls and back. And so you basically just have, this thing is, responds quasi-statically. So basically, again, you tell me the position of the, of the drop, and then you calculate the, the interface by uh, 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 the finding the minimal surface, right? It's a soap film. So we know this has, so basically you say there's a spherical cap with ma which matches onto the drop, right? And then you have... Uh, uh, minimal surface here, so it has to have zero mean curvature, and the only surface that has zero mean curvature uh, in uh, 3D is a catenoid. Right? So we basically match a spherical cap onto a catenoid. That gives us the shape of the uh, film uh, as a function of the position of the drop. So that gives us then the force field acting on the drop. Okay. Okay, and so when it turns out when you plot this, it looks like this. So uh, so this is the force acting on the drop as a function of intrusion depth of the drop. And so for small intrusion depths, in particular in this bouncing regime, this is all we have to worry about. And it's basically a linear dependence, which is very nice, right? So we can suddenly say, oh, well, the interface, the, the soap foam is like a linear spring. Okay? So it's a linear spring, and the spring constant, so F equals KZ, and the spring constant is just linearly proportional to the surface tension. In terms of, so this coefficient actually depends on how big the ring is relative to the drop size, but you can calculate it as a function of the ring size, okay? So it's a very nice feature, and you can hope, if you, because of this uh, result, this sort of good fortune in this being linear, we can actually write down equations of motion and hope to get a real, uh, a good description of the system. Right? Okay, so, uh, so our breakthrough criterion, first of all, 
So again, this, uh, so <coughs> uh, this is, the result is going to depend on this beta parameter, which is the uh, film radius to the drop radius. But uh, basically your criterion for breakthrough is that the initial drop kinetic energy is greater than the surface energy at breakthrough. So at breakthrough, the <coughs> interface basically comes down like this. So it's a catenoid and then it goes vertical. Right? And if you go beyond that, it breaks through. So you can then write this. So you can calculate that surface energy at this point, if you know the size of the drop and the size of the rail. And you can <coughs> then look to see what the critical Weber number is okay? for a given uh, beta, which is this geometric factor. So again, this radius to this radius. And this, so this gives us the prediction to the critical uh, uh, breakthrough uh, Weber number. And so if we look for the, our experiments were done with beta equals 10, which predicts a breakthrough, uh, a critical Weber number of around 15, right? Which is exactly what we had. So that gives us some confidence in, the, in, the, in this linear spring model of the soap film, okay? And so other thing <coughs> which gives us uh, confidence in this model is the fact that the uh, contact time uh, scales as square root of m over k, right? Because that's what, so that's the uh, time scale for a, a, a linear spring. If you have a mass m on a linear spring with spring constant k, then the uh, spring time is square root of m over k, okay? So that, uh, we can see that, so what this shows is that this contact time, so I mean, what is the contact time for drop bouncing on a film? It's basically, of course, it never actually touches, but it's basically the time during which the, drop, the film is being deformed by the drop, right? Okay, so you basically measure this and you see that it doesn't depend on the incoming speed, which is sort of surprising, right? It comes out to be this, square root of m over k. So there is a, a, a weak dependence which we can rationalize later, but the leading order we see that this film is uh, behaving like a linear spring. And certainly in terms of the uh, criteria for, for uh, uh, crossing the film and in terms of the contact time. Okay, okay so, so the only other thing we need to do, so we, we want to write down an equation of motion for this drop, right, for the bouncing drop, and we're going to drive it. So but we need to get some idea of the dissipation in the system, because in order to really write down the equation of motion, we have to get the dissipation. So we can define a coefficient of restitution. So this is the outgoing speed relative to the incoming speed, and we know this is always going to be less than one. So we can define it uh, as here, and we can plot so the change in Weber number over the Weber number, and here we see that this does change uh, on <coughs> change with impact speed. In particular, the higher the incident speed, so again, this is our Weber number, the higher the incident speed, the more energy is lost, okay? And you can rationalize this scaling if you consider that the work done by the film during impact, it's gonna be rho u squared, that's the characteristic pressure, then you have a speed times a time, which gives you a length. So it's basically a force over a given length. Is going, so this, this is the work done, and so that's where the three halves comes from. Okay. Okay. So this is so this is just empirical, right? This is we're just measuring this, and so we're going to throw in a term in our equation which is consistent with this. Right? And you can make, you can argue that if we should have another type, it should look like this, it should look like this, but we don't care <coughs> because it, it, it works, um, as we'll see. And we've actually tried different types, of, but this, we've chosen this form, so, so, this is, <coughs> so this is the equation of motion of the drop now. So mass times acceleration of the drop, no one's going to argue with that. <coughs> no one's going to argue with this. Then we have our linear spring force term, and that acts, this heavy side function says it only acts when the uh, drop is in contact with the film, right? So that's going to act over the contact time. Then we have this dissipation term, and we're modeling it so that it too happens while the drop is in contact with the film. So in reality, it's basically, it has to do with the dissipation of the, uh, generated by the drop oscillation. So that's actually, you can, if you do the scaling, it turns out that that's the biggest source of energy loss. But in any case, we model in this way just for the sake of uh, <coughs> uh, expedience in terms of the analysis. Um, and we've tried this z 
uh, z prime squared form is we have to choose that to be consistent with the data on the uh, observations of the dissipation. But we basically, and we've cho and we've we pull this off the data as well, right? So this we pull off the data. Again, this form is suggested by this scaling which we've observed, and the coefficient is from the experiments. So, um, and we we've calculated this. Okay, so. <clears throat> kind of nice. You have a nice um, ODE and this is what it predicts for, so this is the, a drop just hitting a film, so it decreases in amplitude. This is actually precisely from the sequence and you can see why we, the thing basically bounces out of the field of view, but this is what the model predicts and this is what the, where, what the experiments give. So we can only see the drop when this is the blackout zone where it's behind the uh, where it's behind the, the frame. But it's, so, so it's actually, uh, and again, so this, this, the fact that it's jumping to success, the, the peaks of its jumps get progressively smaller, it's because there's energy being lost to dissipation, which is being modeled by this term here. Right? So it's actually, it does a nice job, right? Uh, so, one can't help ask for much better uh, agreement between theory and experiment. Of course, we've sort of chosen our dissipation term to ensure that, nevertheless. So, let's see what we can do with this now. Because now, you can ask the question, now we basically have the equation of motion uh, for this thing. Now we can drive it, right? So, now we have a force dissipative system and we can look for chaos, okay? So, uh, so we now take our frame, <coughs> we drive it up and down with an amplitude B and frequency F, and, and, and let's see if we can model these bouncing drops. Okay, so what do you see, crudely speaking, uh, you say, okay, let's look at the frequency and the bouncing behavior, so the, let's look at the bouncing behavior as a function of the frequency of the film and the driving amplitude. So this is, again, the forcing acceleration divided by G. So this, uh, we see first of all that you don't get any action above uh, the natural frequency of the film, which is around 55 hertz. So if you, um, this is, should be intuitively uh, familiar. If, it, if any of you have stood on a trampoline, you know, you go like that. If you go like this, you don't move, right? So you're basically, <laughs> there's a critical frequency below which you can expect to jump. And the same is true on, on the soap film. So if we're below this, a natural frequency, then there's a critical amplitude of vibration above which the thing will bounce. If, you, if, if you're driving it, too, if the amplitude is too, too uh, low, then the drop will coalesce with the film. So it'll sit on the film and then just the air layer will drain and it will, uh, it will merge with the film. But above a critical uh, threshold value, you will get uh, bouncing states. Okay. Okay, so you get, and it's very rich, so, <clears throat> so you get uh, various different bouncing states, which we'll call MN, so don't, I guarantee you won't remember this, because I don't remember it. <laughs> so bouncing state, MN bounces N times in M forcing periods. So a one, the one one state, this, the period of the bouncing is the same as the period of the forcing. Here, the period of the, bou of the bouncing is twice the period of the forcing, and here it's three times. So I want you to note one thing. These three are all solutions observed with this exactly the same forcing parameters. So, so the same acceleration, the same amplitude, the same drop. So they ask the question, hmm, how, how is it that I can have three different periodic solutions with the same forcing? Okay. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and then we see this guy here, so here it's a, we call this a 3-3 three, three mode, so it has three different bounces with three different amplitudes, <coughs> and this cycle of three jumps is completed after, uh, after three periods of the forcing. So the, so the bouncing, uh, so it takes three periods, its periodicity is based on three forcing periods, right? Okay? How clear was that? <laughs> okay, but you see what I mean, right? So, we see, so we'll come back to this mode later, but this is, it's, it is perfectly periodic, but it's, uh, so yeah? How do you experimentally select one of those three modes? 
So it actually, so I'll tell you right now, it depends on the phase, right? So which of these solutions you get? Because there's, there's a variable which is phase, right? So it's going to get a different kick depending on when it hits the, when it hits the film. If it hits the film when the film's coming down, it's going to get a little kick. If it hits the film when the film is coming up, such as here, then it gets a big kick, okay? So there can be different periodic solutions depending on phase of impact for the same forcing, okay? Okay, so, but the nice thing is we have the equation of motion, right? Off we go. So we can describe this system exactly. Right? So we have exactly what we had before, and then we have uh, the forcing. So we're basically saying, oh, we're, in a, we're in an accelerating frame now, so we sh this is like our d'Alembert force. So this is our, <coughs> uh, oh, wait, that shouldn't be the g. Oh, yes, it should. Yeah, gamma is, gamma is the forcing acceleration over g. So, uh, but this is basically simply from the fact that we're descri going to describe this now in the uh, accelerating frame of the, of the frame. Un un unfortunate uh, dual use of the word frame in English. But uh, okay, so uh, again, same equation of motion, but now we have a forcing term. So is this like you're turning gravity on and off, right? Uh, okay, so <coughs> we have... Um, so this is, again, what we observe. So these are just those, th those four states which I, or these are the three states I showed you before, these guys here. So the one, one, two, one, three, one. And so what we do is we actually, so what is this data? I take a, we take a slice through the center line of the drop, okay, at each frame, and then we step it forward in time. So you're going to see, so it looks like the, the data looks like, basically gives you the trajectory of the drop. So the 1-1 one, one mode is just the things just going up and down like this, and then the things, but the 2-1 things, the things are, so this is time, and this is position, yeah? Okay, and so you see <coughs> um, the, again, these are the same forcing, so the same forcing acceleration, and uh, frequency, <coughs> the Weber number is different. Weber number is based on the impact speed, so um, here you can see it's landing at a relatively low speed, here a high speed, and it's getting a bigger kick because the, the phase is different between these three uh, experiments. And then, so, and, and this is interesting because so at this forcing frequency, whatever you hit it with, right, is however you initialize the drop, it will, there will be some transient. So that's to say whatever phase and speed you drop it at, it will lock onto one of these three solutions, okay? Those are the only possible solutions. So why three, why not five, why not 10, why not one? And so, but we'll, we'll be able to answer that, okay? Because we have a complete uh, syst uh, mathematical description. And, and so, um, of course, the only limit is that if you, of course, if you hit it, if you drop the drop from too high, it will break the film. But why you don't break the film? There will be some transient, such as you see here, then it locks onto one of the three solutions, okay? Okay, so, um, so here are the, again, so we have the possibility of three different uh, solutions by virtue of the different impact phases, okay? And so these are the numerical solutions based on the model. Uh, uh, so this is the trajectory versus, uh, uh, so basically the height as a function of time, and you can, uh, compare the landing and the takeoff time, uh, takeoff and landing uh, times uh, with experiments, and they match pretty well. Okay. So, uh, and again, it's the difference in phase which allows you to rationalize uh, the, fa the this sort of multi, mul uh, what's the word, multiplicity, um, the fact that you can have more than one solution. Okay. So and now we can look at the uh, use this sort of <coughs> dynamical systems um, language. And so if we plot now speed against position, uh, we have a limit cycle. So um, it's a we have this is for these periodic solutions. So this, by the way, is the kick it gets during during the impact. Um, and uh, so if you look at the power spectrum, it's it's sparse, and you have a negatively Apanov exponent. So that, what that says is if you start somewhere off this curve, you'll soon fall onto it. So the Lyapunov exponent gives an indication of how quickly 
you converge to a limit cycle or diverge. And if it's chaotic, you're going to get a positive Lyapunov exponent. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we can describe the system in terms of uh, a 2D iterative map. So we have, um, uh, we can use a, a Poincare section, and we're interested in the speed of impact and the phase of impact. Okay? So we can solve uh, numerically, so we can just integrate our equations motion and get this, this map. And we can calculate from this map how much energy is being gained by the, uh, during impact, and this is going to depend on the speed of impact as well as the phase of impact. Okay? So again, so we have basically, this is the position, so at, we're going to characterize in terms of its, its um, properties at impact, so at y equals zero, so we have the speed and the phase of impact, these two guys. Okay, and so this is, the, this is basically saying how much energy it's, it's gaining uh, during impact, so per cycle, as a function of the speed of impact and phase of impact. Okay? And <clears throat> so there are zeros. Uh, the, there, so in the shaded region, it's getting extra energy. So it's leaving with more energy than it came in with. Right? And, if it's, and if it's landing in the white region, then it's losing energy. It's coming in with more energy than it's uh, going out with. Okay? And so <clears throat> we know that if it's going to be perfectly periodic, it has to land on the zeros, right? So these are theoretical predictions for the um, uh, for these three uh, different solutions: the one, one, two, one, and three, one modes, right? And we see that, and these are actually the experiments. So we see we're very close in terms of rationalizing them. So, but this is saying so this is a Poincaré section, but the thing's just coming down like this solution, just going boom, 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 right? But we know. For these more complex orbits, like the 3 3 mode, this is a 3 3 mode here. So these are a different forcing accelerations, these four, four pots. We know that it can have an orbit in which the total energy gained in all three bounces is zero, right? So you can bounce across this, this zero line, and so that happens where is the. Uh, yeah, these, these ones down here, so it can have two. It can bounce like this, and as long as the total energy uh, in both bounces is zero, then you can have these more complex states, right? But it's here, so the 3, 3, 1, which we saw, which is the, the bouncing uh, with three different amplitudes, uh, is this one. So it's basically on two of the bounces, it's getting a kick. On the other one, it's losing energy, right? But you have this possibility of more complex uh, orbits. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll see that you can then you can get chaotic. Uh, if you have chaotic maps, then they're, then they're basically just go everywhere. But you can rationalize in this way the, <coughs> the fact that you can get 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1. You can't get the 4, 1. Basically, you can't get the, if you, uh, with this amount of energy kicked in, you can't support a 4, 1 case. It's just beyond the, beyond the zero line. Okay, and so, right, and then we have complex, so more complex <coughs> periodic and aperiodic modes. So this is our, this is our three, three mode. So again, it's periodic after three bounces. And then we have a period doubling transition from a one, one to a two, two. Um, and then we have a chaotic solution, which is just a mess. Uh, which, which follows, so basically as you, increase, as you increase the forcing, you go from periodic to period, through a series of period doubling transitions and then into a chaotic solution. Okay, so, uh, so these are some complex periodic modes which we get from our, from our model. So this is our 3-3. Three, three. Again, we can compare the takeoff and landing phases, which are not bad. You get, I mean, we basically get a, Quantitative agreement for the simpler periodic modes. When things start getting chaotic, hmm, we get qualitative agreement, right? But still satisfactory. And so now, if we look at, so if we plot, if we look at our one of our chaotic modes, we can plot again the velocity versus position, and we get this uh, basically an attractor. And we look at the power spectrum, and it's uh, it's full. 
and the Lyapunov exponent is positive, right? So that what that says is if we start somewhere in here, I have two initial uh, two points in this phase space which are initially close, they will diverge exponentially, and that's the hallmark of, of chaos. Okay, and, and so the Lyapunov exponent I've changed. We had v versus phi. Now, for some reason, we've gone into polar coordinates. But in any case, this is again the place where it gets energy. This is part where it loses energy, but you can see that it's all over the, it's basically filling the, the map. So each one, so this thing's bouncing all over the place. Okay, and so then one can do other things, mathematical things, because you have, uh, we have such a, a, uh, a complete description. Um, Oh yeah, so we get a little revision, we can do a little correction for bouncing period, yada yada, but that's not that's so exciting. Uh, but, but this is kind of nice, so here's a bifurcation diagram. So this is the forcing acceleration, this is the impact speed, and so you see below a certain, uh, <coughs> below a certain threshold you can't get bouncing, and then you see bouncing uh, the system uh, supporting bouncing solutions beyond this critical value, the first one being 2, 1, and then 1, 1. And then if you follow these branches as you increase the forcing acceleration, so basically this, each of these lines has some basin of attraction, right? So if you start here in phase space, you'll basically fall onto this curve. Okay? But so if you follow this one, it'll come along uh, here and then it branches. So that's a period doubling event. So it's going from a 2, 1 to a uh, f uh, 4, 2, is that right? Well, I've clearly updated, I've clearly, yeah. Uh. Yeah, so it should go from 2, 1 to 4, 2, and then you get subsequent period doubling. So, so this is a period doubling event, and then it period doubles again, and so on and so on. So if you zoom in, uh, and then beyond a certain uh, point, you get uh, basically Almost all the solutions are chaotic, but you have these little windows of periodicity, which is something which is sort of classic in uh, dynamical systems as well. So um, if we look at the, these period doubling transitions, so again, so we zoom in. So if we zoom in, uh, this is on the 2-1 branch here. If we zoom in, yeah, 2-1 goes to 4-2, and then 8-4, and you basically, then if you zoom in here, you get this, right? So you really see this nice, and you can look at the, the power spectrum and see the, see the evolution. So you can see the, uh, the, uh, that it, they are indeed period doubling transitions. Um, and so this is a, so there's something very nice. Have you guys done dynamical systems? Um, seen a little bit in So you've seen Feigenbaum numbers? So, and this is a class of um, maps, these, these um, uh, 1D or area preserving 2D maps where you get um, the emergence of this Feigenbaum number. So this is basically looking at the transitions. So these are the thresholds of transition, okay? So this is um, gamma i plus one minus gamma i. So let's say that one minus that one. So, it's the ra so this is the ratio of two lengths. So it's basically this to this, right? So it turns out that um, if you evaluate this in the limit that you go towards this sort of coalescence of uh, uh, the onset of chaos, this converges to a number, which is this, which is the Feigenbaum constant 4.6692, which is quite remarkable. Um, and so we, we looked at these, uh, how our things changed, and they kind of looked like they might be going there, but it's, I, think, uh, I think they maybe aren't. But in any case, it's a good thing to look for. So it's, it's great if you can actually find these things in the lab, right? But another, so lesser, so I knew about these Feigenbaum numbers when I, when I was younger, and I was hoping to get them, see them in the lab, but I think we, um, uh, it's, it is for a restrictive class of problems, and I don't think they would. Uh, I think it has something to do with the, with the, the map being area preserving, whatever that means. But, but the other thing is, so in these, when you get uh, um, uh, maps like this, the ratio of that to that 
is given by the golden mean. Ooh, isn't that cool? <laughs> that to that. So, so you see this is asymmetric. So there's a class of maps for which that ratio to that ratio is always given by the golden mean. So we were hoping it would have been it would have been too good to be true if we got the Feigenbaum numbers and the golden mean coming out of the system. But it's still it's I was pretty happy with the the way it turned out. But these are sorts of things you look at. Uh, we we looked for. But you, you don't approach the golden mean either, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, this one. Yeah, but it kind of looks like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing this, the way this number comes out. The golden mean, right? What is it? One over one plus one over one plus one over. Right? So, so, uh, this equation that you insert in the because you're talking about area preserving and things like that. Usually dissipation destroys the area preserving transformation, right? So What's that? I mean, the, uh, when you have dissipation, yeah. you lose all this uh, area preserving and stuff like that properties, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Have you looked at the idea of this system? Does it change? No, no, no. Yeah, we, we haven't done. We sort of ran out of, the student was only visiting me for a few months, so we stopped. Um, but in any case, it's sort of a nice, I think it's a nice system in that we get really a nearly exact description of the dynamics from a second order ODE. Uh, and we get, you know, we can describe these simple periodic modes quantitatively. And they really, we can really describe what we see in the lab uh, pretty much exactly. And then we get qualitative agreement with the more complex periodic and chaotic modes. Um, and this is a, we have a nice, it's a nice example of a period doubling transition to chaos. And uh, this is certainly one of the cheapest uh, chaotic fluid systems yet explored. So the first um, examples that where they looked at the onset of chaos, and these were really classic experiments. So Liebscherbet did them, and Golub and Swinney, they're basically looking at convection. So this is something we looked at earlier in the course. Um, you heat a fluid from below, and uh, you get the onset of motion, and then you get uh, onset of periodic motion, then you get a period doubling cascade to, to chaos. And these are very high tech, difficult experiments. Um, there's also the dripping faucet is something which also gives periodic behavior. Okay? And uh, so that is uh, rel it's comparable in terms of level of difficulty experimentally, but it's uh, actually much harder to treat theoretically. Um, so if you integrate over ease of experiment and ease of theory, I think this is the simplest fluid chaotic oscillator. So they have looked at solid chaotic oscillators. So a very simple one is just a, a bouncing rubber ball on a, on a plate. And there you get onset of chaos and so forth. And that's uh, also uh, relatively easily char uh, characterized. But if you guys, so, okay. Okay, so that's the end of the lecture. We can stop there. But I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show you guys one other thing. So have you guys seen Fibonacci spirals in plants?